morning. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us today, whether here in person or online. We're happy that you can be with us on this beautiful day. If you um, look in your bulletin, you'll see several announcements. I'll just call your attention to just a few of them. Today after worship will be um, the continuation of our Bible study on the book of Acts, um, books three and four, and we look forward to seeing you there. Easter food donations will continue until March 24th. Please bring your donations in. There is a box that you can place those in under the table in, to the left of the sanctuary. Um, if you would rather give a check, you may do so, <coughs> excuse me, and you can make it out to the Back Mountain Food Pantry. We are winding um, down our Easter fundraiser with the bakery rolls from Royal Bakery. If anyone has any orders, you can see me or Karen Perzia to give us those final orders. I do need all orders in by um, March 19th. So, and we thank you for purchasing them and making this fundraiser a success. And any additional, we, we can always use liturgists and assistance with Meals on Wheels. Um, and please see your bulletin for any additional announcements. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Please join me now responsively in the call to worship. Out of the depths I cry for you, O Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear my voice. voice. Let, Let your ears, ears be attentive the to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all of its iniquities. Amen. Thank you. 
and sky, great creator, master of all nature, who gives birth to snow from heaven, holds the waves at ocean's edge, gives the orders to the morning, shows each dawn place to shine, God of heaven, God of all the earth and sky. God of ages, God who heals us, God who gives us peace and hope, God who listens, carries all our fragile dreams and heartaches, wins and failures, binds the broken, hides the Thank you, Pam and Jessica. That was beautiful. Please now, please join me now in the call to confession responsibly. The Lord be with you. And also with you. May the grace of the Lord with us all. Together, let us confess our sins before him this day. Forgiving, Forgiving Lord, we have fallen short time and time again. You have, you have given, given us your word, word both in scripture and in your son. You have promised us your presence, both in spirit and in community. 
and you have raised us with your kingdom, both in teaching and in service. Even so, we neglect, ignore, and reject your purposes for us. We do not love what you love. We do not embrace what you embrace. We do not defend what you have called us to defend. Have mercy on us, O God, of all ages past and all hope for years to come. Forgive us for what we do and what we fail to do. And with your gifts, promises, and grace, and continue working in our lives that we might receive full life in Jesus Christ now and forevermore. Amen. My dear and good friends, as we have come to confess our sins unto the good Lord this day, I declare unto you, truly as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us, believe in the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. seated. I'm looking over here to my left at this moment in God's time, and what do I see? It appears to be a leprechaun of, of sorts. Barbara? Well, why do you think I'm wearing this goofy, glittery thing on my head in this bright green dress? Why do you think, Ruth? Today is St. Patrick's Day. Look at all the green going on in this church. Well, do you know why we celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Why do we put this green on? Why do what, John? long ago, and he was a missionary, and he worked to bring the story of Jesus to the country of Ireland, but there are other things Ireland is known for. It's a country of green hills and fields, and it also has some interesting traditions, too, like leprechauns and shamrocks and things that are called lucky. Shamrock's on his skirt. Drew's wearing green. The 
some people say that finding a clover with four leaves instead of three is good luck. I brought some things in addition to the cat that people consider lucky. Let me show you. What's this? A horseshoe. A horseshoe, yes. And actually, it's a real horseshoe. And it had to get cleaned up because it was kind of dirty. <laughs> yes, and, and I have some I have something else here. Whoops. I'm gonna show you. <coughs> what do you think this might be? A coin. Some people have certain coins that they consider lucky. And they may carry them with them, a lucky coin. Yes, yes. And I don't have one, but some people have a rabbit's foot. They say that if you have a rabbit's foot and you rub it, that's going to bring you good luck. Well, what are, what, what are all of these things? What could they all be called? Lucky. Lucky, right. Lucky charms. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there's also things, Charlotte, or Scarlett, and I know from this, did you have breakfast today? I might have to hide you. <laughs> okay, but some people there think that there are um, bad things, like just the opposite of, for bad luck. Can you think of something that might be bad luck? I have to tell you, I don't believe any of the good stuff, but I, I kind of cringe when I'm driving down the road and an all-black cat runs out in front of me. Uh, that just kind of unnerves me. Um, any, anything else? Some people think like walking under a ladder. They'll, go out, they'll even cross the street so they don't have to walk underneath the ladder because they consider that good, bad luck. And what? She's got a good one opening an umbrella inside your house. I won't do that either. I put it in the garage. Working, worrying about what might be good or bad luck only makes us feel scared. And God does not want to waste our, want us to waste our time on needless fear. He wants us to trust in Him because God is always in charge. None of this believing in the good and bad luck. Even when things are not so great, God is in charge. He loves us too much to leave our circumstances to chance or silly lucky charms. When we don't know what's coming, God is in charge. When things are good, God is in charge. The Bible tells us that he loves us and that he will take care of us no matter what. We might not know the whole future, but we know God always wins. So try not to worry. Too much. Know that God cares for you. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for being in charge in all things. Help us to put our trust and hope in you. Help us not to be afraid, but to love you. Thank you for taking care of us. Amen. Can I ask you to take us into the two things that you asked us to do on the way to bed? God help us. Sunday school, okay? I have some things to say. Let me go back to the last one. Oh, thank you. I think I got this note. <laughs> Take me home
seated. Once again, Jessica, thank you for your beautiful anthem this morning. Absolutely beautiful. And likewise, Barbara, thank you. Barbara reminded me of something this morning that I completely forgot about. As I look across the face of the congregation and over here to my left, I see particularly the women are wearing a certain shade of green, green. I'm Scotch-Irish. English and German, but mostly Scotch-Irish. And guess who forgot to wear green this morning? It have, I'll wear the hat. <laughs> oh, my. Well, again, I welcome all of you this morning as we draw together on this fifth Sunday in the Lenten season. Where has the time gone? It's, it's just gone like a vapor. Here we are on the fifth Sunday, moving closer and closer to the cross of Christ. And for this morning, we're taking a look at 1 Corinthians, beginning with chapter 1, verse 18. And if you will, listen carefully for the word of the Lord as the Lord speaks to you this day. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligence, and I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are, all not, are not to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Thus ends the reading of his holy word for this day, and I pray God let his blessing unto it. From time to time, when I see a good movie posted over here at Montage or wherever, I like to go and see what's happening, see what the, the latest and the greatest is. A while back, Karen and I had the opportunity to go see a movie that, uh, if you haven't seen, I really recommend, strongly recommend. And, well, if you don't get to see the movie, I just happen to have the book. It's entitled, A Beautiful Mind by Sylvia Nassar, A Beautiful Mind. Came out a few years ago, and interestingly, it's a story, a true life story, of a gentleman by the name of John Nash. Do you recognize his name? Surely you do. John Nash was a brilliant 
real life Princeton trained mathematician. For those of you who like to play with the numbers, it might ring a bell. In 1994, John Nash won the Nobel Prize in Economics. But interestingly, and this is the reason for the story, it turns out that the defining challenge of Nash's life was not his academic achievements, but rather his debilitating schizophrenia. He was a schizophrenic. And this is something that he battled for most of his life. Now, mind you, this is not a story about a man who was cured of his illness, not at all. But rather, it's a story about a man who ultimately finds his way through his illness. And the key, the key to John Nash's ability to find some kind of wholeness and wellness in his life happened to come through the constant, steadfast, heroic love of his wife, Alicia. You can well imagine, I trust, how difficult it must be to love and believe in and hope for someone whose life becomes as unlovable, as pointless, and as hopeless as John Nash's. How easy it would be, particularly if you ever read the story, how easy it would have been to give up on such a person. His is an amazing story, and still his brilliance shined throughout the pages of this book, as well as the movie. His wife, Alicia, never gave up on him. Now, the interesting thing is, if you ever go see the movie, stick with it. Don't jump up and get out of your seat. You know, when the credits begin to roll, you know how they roll at the end of the movie? In this case, as the credits begin the roll at the end of the movie, guess what? This appears on the screen at the very end of the movie, The Sign of the Cross. It causes me to think this morning as you and I come together on this fifth Sunday in the Lenten season, I don't know, I don't know if this is your experience, but frankly, as I get older, and I feel kind of like an old man, I find myself no longer content to think about my faith in mere theological terms. Have you ever found yourself thinking about your faith in mere theological terms? I mean, when you think about it, the meaning of the cross, especially within the context of the Apostle Paul's beautiful words that are in our scripture lesson this morning about the cross being the power of God for those who are being saved, I must confess, I find myself wondering what that actually looks like in real life. Have you ever considered this? What does the power of the cross actually look like to you out there in everyday life? Huh. What does it look like to begin to comprehend the significance of the cross, and that somehow, some way, it is the power of God. Why do we need this affirmation concerning the cross as 
Paul outlines for us according to the scripture lesson this morning. But for some amazing reason, he tells us that it ultimately leads to something called joy. Pure joy. And so I ask myself these questions this morning, and as I do so, I find myself once again back in that darkened theater over at Montage. And boy, it is dark in there, by the way. I find myself back there in that darkened theater. And as I consider this story, a tear begins to form on the corner of my eye. And I sense intuitively, I sense that the tear is coming from some powerful force <coughs> of raw emotion deep down inside my soul that has been touched by the love I have witnessed in this story. And when I follow that tear, just a single tear, when I follow that tear back inside of myself and trace it all the way back to where it must have begun, I begin to realize that it has flowed from some wonderful inner spring of joy. It is truly a tear of joy. And I think to myself, it must have something to do with this, to cry that tear of joy, watching a movie out there in a theater. My dear friends, this wonderful inner spring of joy in my life has been tapped and released by this story, this wonderful story. And I strongly recommend that if you haven't already done so, take some time to read it. And how one woman's Christ-like love made all the difference in the world in her relationship with her husband, who ultimately won the Nobel Prize. That's what this will do. It reminds me once again, as I look at the scripture lesson for this morning and think of Paul's declaration, we come to realize that for Paul, the cross truly is God's declaration of love for all humankind, for all of us. And in light of this reality, I ask myself, what does this mean? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for me? Particularly as we continue our Lenten pilgrimage on this fifth Sunday, what does it mean to bear the cross? It's a hard thing to do in the 21st century, postmodern America, is it not? Just yesterday, I was talking to one of our parishioners who's sitting way back there in the last pew this morning. And she said to me, you know, Murray, the other day I was in conversation with, I believe, a young lady. We got into kind of a theological discussion. And the young lady told her, oh, you don't believe in that stuff anymore, do you? This is where we are in the 21st century. They don't believe. It's up to you and me to make it come alive and be vibrant and real to the point where they begin to see this is the true source of joy. It's only to be found in the cross. To me, it means that whenever you take the extraordinary God-born love that this cross represents, 
which is the most amazing love the world has ever known and ever will know, and carry it out there into life. You'll find this in your engagement with, in your encounters with, and in your dialogue with people like your wife, your husband, your child, your parent, your grandparent, your friend, your neighbor, your coworker, your classmate, your employee, your employer, the waitress, the checkout counter clerk at Weiss, the repairman, maybe even the church member, maybe even somebody on the staff of Trinity Presbyterian Church. You are bearing the cross in all of these encounters, all of these encounters, which is precisely what happened to my friend sitting back there at the rear of the sanctuary told me just yesterday. How do you bear the cross to somebody who stands there and says to you, you don't believe that stuff anymore, do you? You've got your work cut out for you. Paul tells us, Paul says this bearing of the cross, interestingly, has a kind of invisible power. And that this kind of love sets the stage for God's healing and transforming power to touch people's lives for saving and for making whole, which is really the literal translation. It becomes the power of God to make whole those who are touched by the love of the cross. If I may this morning, as we continue our Lenten pilgrimage, I would like to offer to your, or commend to you, the following suggestions. How do you bear the cross in the season of Lent? as we mark the fifth Sunday in the Lenten season, at a time knowing, knowing in our heart of hearts the ultimate joy that it can bring to another person, not to mention yourself. I'll make this simple. Beginning today, when you step outside of the sanctuary, wherever you may find yourself, identify one person one person in your life whom you know needs to be touched by the love of God as expressed by the cross. One person. Secondly, dedicate the relationship you have with that person to God so that you'll know you're not doing this all by yourself. Find one person, dedicate your relationship to that person, to God. And thirdly, here's the rough part. Commit yourself to loving that person for the duration, for the long haul. That's it. So you're going to go out there beginning this morning, later on today, tomorrow, identify one person to whom you will start bearing the cross of love, dedicate that relationship to God, and then ask God to make himself known within the relationship and commit yourself to the friendship for the long haul. And I truly believe that if you do this, that in the course of your relationship with that other person, who might just be your next door neighbor, that you will discover the joy of bearing the cross. 
I'll share with you another little vignette. Again, it happened just yesterday. Very simple. Speaking of neighbors, late yesterday afternoon, there I was, sitting out on the front porch in my favorite man chair with my sun hat on, watching the motorcycles go up and down the highway, watching the trailers going up and down the highway, and all those brand new pick em up trucks, GMC, Chevrolets, you know, the monster trucks, up and down the highway. I sat there for about an hour, and then I noticed my neighbor just down the street about, oh, I don't know, 100 yards or so. And, uh, well, Karen and I have been there for 10 years now. Do you think we know our neighbors? Nah. She stood down there doing something with her little, she has little ducklings or chickens or something like that. I think most of them almost got blown away in the storm that went through the other day. But I saw her standing there, and I knew that she wanted to take care of her little ducklings or was in the process of taking care of them. She turned, saw me sitting there watching her, and you know what she did? Now think about this. This is 10 years that we've been there. I... Hello, I just about fell out of my chair. <laughs> and then somehow I thought, you know, I have to respond, so wave to her. There's your contact with a neighbor. You see how this works? And it was a friendly wave. We connected, and I know that we'll make that connection again probably sometime soon. It makes all the difference in the world. That young lady or that young man at the checkout counter at, what's it called, Sam's Club or someplace like that, Weiss, nine times out of ten, when I'm checking out, they're standing there, and are they focused on the customer? Well, sometimes. But you know what I hear them talking about? All the troubles they're having with their boyfriend, or their girlfriend, or, oh, it's almost time for my break. That's what I'm hearing at the counter. There's your point of entry. That's your point of entry. It's time to get to know the checkout person behind the counter because they're expressing a deep-seated spiritual need. They're hurting, and you have the answer. Amen. If you will, friends, turn with me now to our second hymn of the morning, another one of the great Lenten hymn, hymns that is selection number 80, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley.
seated. On this fifth Sunday of the Lenten season, gladly, cheerfully, and joyfully do we now present our morning offering under the good Lord's safekeeping.
sojourn this year. Remind us, all of us, of the power as well as the joy of your cross. It is from the cross that we find salvation in you, your one and only Son, Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Bless us all through him, O Lord, we pray. Bless our offerings this day, this day toward the greater, your greater glory as well. This I pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, you may be seated. So we're coming to our prayer time this morning. I'm turning to say good morning to Pam. Normally, I always say good morning to her, but somehow I failed to do so. Welcome, Pam. <laughs> and I see you're wearing green as well. So, yeah. <laughs> This has been a, uh, an interesting week for the Thompsons, as most of you probably know by this time. Um, my wife, Karen, continues to deal with, struggle with shingles. And for those of you who have experienced shingles at some point, they're not very pleasant. And it can take a while to get through this experience. I mentioned to a couple of our folks earlier that she has them the whole way around her torso. They're very painful. Medications help, but unless you keep ahead on your medication, they hit like this. And uh, it's just not very pleasant. At the same time, both of us want to extend our gratitude to all of you for your prayer support, uh, your delicious meals. My goodness, I didn't realize we had such good cooks in Trinity here at Trinity Presbyterian Church, but we apparently do. Thank you for your meal support, your cards, and your love. Um, Karen will probably be a couple more weeks anyway. Uh, dealing with this before she's able to return and uh, mingle with us safely because shingles can be contagious. So it's something to bear in mind. Also, family-wise, uh, as I mentioned to you last week, my stepmother was admitted to the Armstrong County Memorial Hospital located just outside of uh, Catanning, Pennsylvania, in Armstrong County. Uh, She's 90 years old, her health is deteriorating, and over the course of the week, uh, she had to undergo gallbladder surgery. Shortly following the gallbladder surgery, uh, we discerned through our conversations by phone that her voice is now much, much weaker. She has an obstruction somewhere in her system. They took her to the intensive care unit last night uh, and frankly, I thought I was going to get a, receive a call last evening asking us to come and, and be with the other side of the family. Um, all of which to say, if between now and whenever I suddenly disappear, do not panic. It's simply because of necessity, Karen and I will have to make a trip back to Western Pennsylvania because we don't think that she has a whole lot of time left. Again, thank you for your prayers. We continue to pray for Neil and Mary back there. It's so good to see you two again this morning. Uh, what a joy it is. Uh, we are thankful for your presence this morning. Uh, it's just so good to see you. Um, Nancy Williams has not been well the last couple of weeks. Um, as you know, she kind of goes back and forth. Please keep Nancy Williams in your thoughts and prayers. Additionally, um, I believe it was a former teacher of you, Alice, Alice Coker. Her name is Dorothy Withy Carroll, one of your school teachers, high school teacher. Way back when, uh, our prayers go out to her and her family. She apparently did pass, is that right? At age 103, imagine that. Uh, Dorothy Carroll uh, was Alice's teacher at a place called Westmoreland High School a while back, and uh, our prayers go out to her. Um, also, I was I got 
asked this past week to help provide uh, funeral support at Second Presbyterian Church located in Pittston, Pennsylvania. Um, attorney Mark Singer did, in fact, go home to the Lord after 187 days in the hospital. He went to just about every specialty center up and down uh, the eastern portion of, of Pennsylvania as part of a, an overall effort to regain his health. For 187 days, he survived. And much like Alicia Nash in this book that I shared with you earlier, his wife was instrumental in keeping him going because she went to visit him every single day. I had his service uh, just the day before yesterday at Second Presbyterian Church. Mark uh, Singer and his wife Heidi and his daughter Angelica, uh, we offer our support to them, our prayer support. Uh, he's just, they're, they're just a great family. Please be thinking of them uh, in your, and keep them in your prayers. Are there any others? Let us go to the good Lord. Well, Lord, we do thank you for the gift of today as we draw together on this fifth Sunday in the Lenten season. And again, we, we wonder, where has the time gone already? Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Resurrection Day, we know, are just on the horizon. We eagerly, joyfully look forward to the atoning work of your Son, Jesus Christ, upon his cross in anticipation of Easter Day. And as we do so, we pray for your blessing, the blessing of your Spirit to be upon all of us as we continue our journey. Particularly, uh, we pray this day for your blessing to abide with my stepmother, Gail Thompson, my wife, Karen, Nancy Williams, Mary and Neil Morrison, Heidi and Angelica Singer, Mark Singer, who now lives with you eternally, and also Dorothy Carroll. What a blessing she was in the life of Alice, going home to your kingdom at age 103. We thank you for the blessing of her presence in uh, the life of her, her students and in the life of Alice. Bless all of us, O oh Lord, we pray, and if any at, are at home today not feeling well, fill them, we pray, with your spirit of love and support and wellness through the healing touch of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught each and every one of his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, abide with each and every one of us this day. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you all, and enjoy a warm and pleasant afternoon. Amen.